Welcome everybody to an amazing chess game that has not received a lot of attention here on YouTube. Gary Kasparov versus the world in the year 1999. This was a match that had taken place before set up by MSN where there's a bulletin board and a team of grandmasters like Etienne Bakro, there was Felicon, Irina Crush and Elizabeth Peitz and basically every 24 hours they would vote on a move on the bulletin board and respond and Gary would play his own move as well. I've got not much else of an introduction. I'm going to take you through the entire game. It is a brilliant and complex fight with a lot of story behind it. So here we go. I mean, that's about as best of an introduction as I can give you. Gary's got the white pieces and he begins the game with E4. Now, the world team responds with the Sicilian defense, Gary's own. I mean, Gary plays this all the time with the black pieces and we get knight to F3, D6. And before we move any further... I just also want to say it's 1999. So engines, computer software at this point for chess is about 25, 2600. It's a good useful tool, but it's not the all-knowing entity, which is why this match was even possible. Here, Gary plays the move bishop to b5 check, which isn't like a crazy surprise. Uh, it's a move. It's known as the Moscow variation, but it's not what Gary normally plays. Gary, you know, oftentimes plays d4, the open Sicilian. So we already kind of get a trade of bishops. Now remember, this is all voting chess, right? So there's a bit of an influence. Um, and Gary plays c4. And it's funny because Gary actually apologized, literally apologized for the move bishop b5 because he was essentially saying, look, this is not what I normally play. I know we were all expecting a crazy complex game, but I want to save some of my preparation for the upcoming world championship match. Now Gary plays the move c4. This kind of pawn structure, e4 with c4, Against the Sicilian defense is known as the Maroxi Bind. At least that's the American pronunciation. It's probably pronounced slightly differently. Um, but it's called the Maroxi Bind, spelled M-A-R-O-C-Z-Y. Look it up. It is a great way to restrict your opponent's play. And essentially, white will at some point play d4, in this case right now. And after it takes, takes, bishop g7. Black kind of has the standard position uh, of the Sicilian defense. And here, normally, play will continue in some fashion with b3, f3. And white gets this kind of light-squared pyramid because they don't have a light-squared bishop any longer. But here, Gary voluntarily retreats. Chess theory has a lot of moves here, but he voluntarily undevelops the knight from the center because he doesn't want it to come under fire of the bishop on g7 and the knight on c6. Here, play traditionally goes castles by black. But in this position, we have our first developing story. Irina Crush suggested the move queen to e6, immediately looking to punish white for moving out of the center and saying, hey, you got two weaknesses. How are you going to protect them? It's not so simple. And she went to the other grandmasters on the world team and was like, hey, let's analyze this move. And they all did. They analyzed the move and they said, okay, this is nice. This is going to lead to some crazy stuff. And a novelty was born. So... The move 10, queen e6, had never been played before, and it's been played to this day. And at this point, they made a rule that the titled players on the world team could not coordinate. They had to do their own analysis and bring it to the table, and then there would be a vote, but they couldn't coordinate, which was interesting. So Gary plays knight to d5, because if Gary were to play queen here, guarding both, then he would run into knight to e5, punishing him, because the queen is, you know, kind of moving uh, and walking into a target. So now, complete pandemonium takes place. We get queen takes e4, okay? Knight to c7 check, all forced. King to d7, knight takes rook, and now queen takes pawn. Because the knight is trapped. Knight's not going anywhere. And here Gary plays a pretty f fascinating move. He says, well, you're going to win my knight, but you're only going to win it on my terms. Knight to b6, that's known as a desperado. It's when you're going to lose something but you lose it in a way that's advantageous to you. Sometimes that means you get a piece. In this case, Gary doubles the pawn structure of the world team. And here we, we kind of have our, our, our beginning, right? This is the, the chapter one, the introduction. The opening has settled. We have an insane complex position where black has a knight and two pawns for a rook. So it's completely equal. There's a couple of ways to develop the position here. One way is to play b3, attacking the queen, but... but Gary rejected that, and for good reason, because the queen would rotate over here and start harassing his king. There's also this move, bishop to e3. Now, bishop to e3 is a move, but again, black is fast with counterplay, defending the pawn from the bishop, hitting the bishop, and the bishop is open up like this. So here, Gary broke the principle of not moving a piece multiple times in the opening and played knight to c3. It's the most flexible move that he has. It fights for the center, 
Maybe in the future he will play bishop e3 and knight d5 for black will not be possible. And now it's not so easy for black to make a move. At this point, enter a new character of our story. The GM school of the Soviet Union, who themselves began suggesting moves. Now their moves were taken into consideration, but not always. So they weren't having a dramatic effect on the match, but they were adding to this massive analysis. So in some ways, there's the beauty of analyzing a position for 24 hours, right? There's that element of it, and the computer can't tell you everything. But on the other side, there's the competitive aspect. Gary Kasparov is now literally playing the Soviet school, the world school, the American school, everybody. And here, there was a huge debate. Should black play b5 to create counterplay, e6 to solidify in the center, d5 to fight back in the center, knight to e4 to trade off Gary's most powerful piece, or should they play rook to a8, activating their rook on the open file? This was a hotly contested move. The Soviet school pushed heavily for b5. They thought the queenside counterplay was really good, and then it would have led to some chaos, but ultimately, the move that won everybody over was rook to a8, and oftentimes, not by a majority, it was like 43%, but it received more votes than any other move, right? So rook to a8 gets played, black activates their rook. Now here, Gary Kasparov responds with one of his many absolutely brilliant moves, this move a4. What the heck is that? Number one, black can no longer play b5, so whatever the, you know, the Soviet school suggested, that counterplay is shut down. Number two, Rook up and over further down the line. So Gary shuts down the queenside counterplay, ma makes a very important pawn move that restricts the play of black. You know the other idea that black had of playing this move, rook to a8? This is absolutely fascinating. Rook a5. Black was thinking to activate the rook like this. I mean, that look, like, are you kidding me? This is what happens when brilliant minds come together. So Gary's move a4 shuts down that plan because now he has knight b5. He glues the infiltration of the rook shut with the move a4. Brilliant stuff. I mean, this is, this is truly brilliant. Like, if you haven't clicked out of the video yet, I know it's only been a few minutes, but there is much more to come. This game is fascinating and full of ideas, and I will tell you at the end what Gary Kasparov said about this game. So black plays knight to e4. Of course, there is, uh, you know, a lot of... Um, kind of controversy here as well. Should black kind of play with which, which knight should move forward? Should black stay patient? Ultimately, the move knight to e4 getting confrontational, won everybody over, and after takes, takes, Gary responds with queen to b3, attacking the pawn on b6, and the pawn on f7. Now, this is the 18th move for black, and here, black has a couple of ways to deal with this. Option number one, play the move e6, disallow Gary from taking the pawn, and jump into the center like this. Option two, just jump into the center like this. <laughs> Give Gary the option of which pawn to take, and then I will try to come in and attack the king. But Alexander Halifman, member of the GM school, suggested an interesting move here, f5, taking a little bit of space on the king side and offering Gary the b6 pawn. And that move won the vote. And at this point, it becomes clear the GM school is having quite an effect. But Gary finds the best move for white. He plays the move bishop to g5. And this move puts the bishop on a very active square, targets this pawn, and for example, a move like h6, which looks like it's a good move. The other thing of bishop g5, it has nothing to do with the bishop. It has to do with the rooks. The rooks are connected. So now you can play rook e1, and you are going to get to e6 with your queen, at which point you will win the game. Once you break in, you're going to win the game. In fact, it's not even rook e1 this way, it's actually rook e1 this way. Why? Because rook e1 this way is met with the beautiful rook takes a4. And if you take it, you get mated. If you take the queen, you get mated. So you've got to play queen takes. And then I will take the queen, and then I will take the bishop, and who the hell knows what's going on in that position. So bishop to g5 has some layers to it. Now this move up to this point got the lowest percentage vote thus far for black. The move queen b4. Essentially, the world team wanted to make a queen trade to kind of send the game into an endgame, but at the same time, they knew Gary's next move, which was going to be queen f7. They anticipated this. They wanted him to infiltrate on f7 uh, and, and attack the position over there. Here they played bishop to e5, and that move kind of glues the position shut, uh, doesn't really allow white to infiltrate down the middle, and here we get h3 and a, and a fourth sequence of moves. The other thing about bishop e5, it sets the trap queen h7, rook h8, which... Obviously, I don't need to tell you, Gary Kasparov did not fall for, and that is why he, at this point, played the move h3, so the pawn on h2 would no longer be a target, and he is now threatening to take on h7. 
Black here plays rook takes a4. We have rook takes, we have queen takes a4, he takes, they take, he takes, and they bring the queen back. Okay, so what the heck is going on? Still, black maintains a two-pawn advantage, although those pawns are doubled. Black has a knight and white has a rook, but white's rook is very passive. Dynamically, the position is insanely complicated. Maybe white has a slight advantage. Uh, for starters, white does have, uh, in you know, the h-pawn, which will be very useful. And just in general, you know, queen versus and rook positions where there's a queen and a knight, you're going to feel the presence of the rook a lot better than you're going to feel the presence of the knight. Knights are slow. Bishops are fast. Knights are slow. The knight takes a few moves to get in, and even when it does, I'll just move over. And that king's back rank is very weak. You know, in the future, if my rook does find a way to make it over there, it's going to be bad news for black. So Kasparov plays queen to f7. Black plays bishop to d4. And we have queen, F7, uh, we have queen b3 back. Now, this move, queen b3, is an absolutely fascinating move. And again, this storyline on move 26 for black is, is, is so wild. So they wanted to play bishop c5. The world team wanted to play bishop back, guarding everybody, and allowing the knight to get to d4 and e2. But they realized that Gary's idea, queen b3, doesn't just have to do with pressure here, and maybe he wants to bring the bishop back. Gary actually wants to bring the queen to b1. Because, oh, and I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, if bishop goes back to c5, he wants to play queen to b1. This trade of queens will lead to a better endgame for white, where the h-pawn will be decisive. And black's pawn structure doesn't do them any favors. So instead, they voted to play, instead of bishop c5, the move f4, trying to fight on this side. The move f4 won 42.6% of the votes. The move bishop c5 won 42.1. It was that close. But ultimately, they went with the move f4. Irina Crush's move, by the way. Uh, she was a major part of the, of the world team's analysis. At some point, they played 40 of her moves in a row. But we're only on move 26, so we'll get there. Queen back to f7. So Gary baits the pawn forward, and then he goes back to f7 to target it from the f7 square with the bishop, right? So now we get bishop back to e5, protecting, and Gary says, all right, it's time to push my pawn. They push theirs, I push mine, queen to c4 offering a trade of queens. Logical. Gary has a big decision to make. Does he trade the queen, but connect their pawns? Now he undoubles black's pawn and advances it forward a square. He says, no, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to give a check. Now their only move is this, and now I'm going to trade. So you notice he doesn't trade on their terms. He keeps the pawns doubled and gets it down to a really wacky endgame. And here Gary plays another absolutely amazing move, g3. You say, what the heck is so amazing about that? That's just a free pawn. Takes, takes. Oh. Well, if I take, look at what Gary does there. He finds a way to activate his rook without moving it. All of a sudden, the rook is completely activated, right? If bishop takes g3, I just push. And we might get an endgame that looks like this! Rook f8 deflecting the bishop! So you have to let me queen? What the heck is going on here? This position was a subject of massive debate on the bulletin board. Absolutely massive. People couldn't figure out what the hell was going on here. They were like, it's knight and four pawns versus a rook. What the heck? What the heck? A rook and a bishop, I should say. Like, who's winning here? Who the heck has the advantage? And they thought that in the long run, that black was going to lose. They just thought that Gary with the rook, the pawns are too slow. If the pawns were all connected, maybe. But they didn't like this. So instead of taking, they decided to play b4. Gary responded with bishop to f4. Now, the crazy thing about bishop f4, I told you, this has a story. No one on the bulletin board thought about bishop f4. Gary played a move that the day prior had not been analyzed. This came as a shock. He played a move that was barely analyzed at all. So all the prep they did went out the window, and they had to restart. And a lot of their calculations began with, obviously, is the trade good? Daniel King recommended bishop to h8. Um, in fact, I think I forgot to shout him out in the intro, but he was on that, on that world team. He said, just go back, block the pawn, and fight from a distance. But there was a big vote for bishop to d4 check being a bit more confrontational. And that one ultimately won. And here for the second move in a row, Gary played a move 
which was so strange. The computer doesn't pick it up unless, unless it gets deep into depth 30. It almost doesn't look like it makes any sense. If I ask you where you're gonna move the king, of course you're gonna say here, Gary Kasparov played king to h1. And for the second move in a row, he played a move that 24 hours of analysis didn't cover. And so at this point, people started getting suspicious. They were like, is Gary reading the bulletin board? Is he looking at what we're coming up with and counteracting that? Which is not illegal at all. It's just, is he doing that? Is he here? Is Gary among us? <laughs> you know? Um, and, and the reason King H1 is important is because there are positions where the knight can jump in and take the bishop and it will be check. I'm not even joking. Like b3, knight b4, knight d3, knight takes, check. And that is why Gary anticipated all of that and played king to h1. The king h1 has its drawbacks. Further down the line, you're gonna have to play king g2. You just will, right? So now the world team played b3. Gary played g4, he's pushing his own pawn. And here there was a big debate about the move b2. And that would have led to g5, knight before g6, knight d3. And you see what, my, you see what I'm saying? Gary would have played h6 here, and knight takes f4 would have come with check in the other position, but now white just pushes. You see? So instead of that, the world team played king to d5, activating their king. Gary pushes. They push. Why would they do that? What the heck is e6? It's a brilliant thing about putting minds together. Knight to e7. The knight is going to rotate over backwards. Not forwards. It's not going forward. It rotates backwards to guard the pawns. Gary plays the move h6. They play knight to e7. Gary plays rook to d1, pinning the bishop to the, to the king. It's a problem, right? And also, he's threatening to win the pawn behind the king. Now, here, they played e5, kicking out the bishop. The bishop goes here. And Gary finally gets that trade. The major key component to this endgame is the the fact that the pawns are doubled. Gary has deliberately kept this throughout the game, the doubled pawns, because they kill Black's ability to move forward. If the pawns were together, he could push them, they could push them both, but they can't just push one all the way and then the other, because the rook patrols. The rook could stand on the back rank and the pawns could just, you know, fall down. It's like that, the, you know, those games where like the fruit falls and you gotta cut it. What is that, Fruit Ninja? I used to play that back in the day. Like, that is exactly what that looks like. You just slice through the fruit. So here, they play, you know, Gary plays king to g2, they push, and he just brings the king. Because th there is no mobility for black. And black has to dedicate all this time, right? King to c3, now Gary throws in h7, forcing the knight to go to g6, and now he plays king e4. He's not threatening to take because pawn promotes, but white can't, black can't move. Black can't move at all, because if they play d3, I just take with check. So what does black do? King c2, only thing, right? Now we get rook to h1, d3. You could, you, you, I mean, if you promote now, what ends up happening here is that I take, take, and I take. And this is winning. Do the math. B5, king to E4, B4, king F5. I'm threatening to take and push. I'm faster than you are, so knight to H8. And now it's not this, although that probably might, if you count that, that's not going to work. I think it's too slow, so you go G6. Take, take. I queen. You're still a few scores away. I'm going to beat you. So for that reason, the world team played d3. Gary played king to f5. We get this, 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 and this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the world team is up a pawn. Both sides have queened. But Gary Kasparov is much closer and much more realistically going to make a second queen. So what the heck is going on here? Gary here plays the move queen to h7. Now, very important point. How many pieces are left on the board? Seven, right? Seven, position, seven pieces in any position is solved nowadays. In 2012, that's something known as a table base. Software engineers created, I don't know if it's called an algorithm or what, but any chess position with seven pieces or less is solved. The optimal way to win is figured out. Do humans know it? No. Can they memorize it? No chance. And back then in 1999, nobody knew that. So nobody could put this position into a computer because computers, they, have, they, they just lose. They fall off a cliff in endgames. They cannot possibly analyze everything. doesn't matter how deep they go. Gary played a move, queen h7, setting up a discovered attack on the king on b1. And here we have a massive moment in the match. A huge debate ensued. What to do? Do we push? Do we give a check? Do we move the king out of the way? What do we do? Irina Crush, at this point, 
suggested king to a1. Because if you take on b7, uh, then black can draw after d5. You hide the king on a1, you push the pawn, somehow, some way, the pawn ends up coming down. The king is safest on this square. And modern day engines agree. Gary Kasparov himself agreed that king to a1 would have been a dead draw. But no one knew that back in the day. <laughs> now it's very easy. And even now the computer is saying it's like a bad move. It needs to be proven right. Whatever. So they played b5. This was the first move in 40 moves that Irina Crush's main suggestion was not taken as the move. 40 moves. They were following what she was... Not because she was recommending it and then, you know, they played it because she was bossing them around because, you know, she was recommending good moves and they would analyze them, right? So... King to f6, and now again, heated debate. What do, you, what do you do with the king? And they went king to b2. Modern day chess analysis shows that king to c1 was the better move. And back then, a few people did suggest king to c1. And again, just the absolute ocean we have to swim in to even analyze why that move is the best move, right? King to b2. I hear Gary plays queen to h2 to hit the king. King moves again, and he plays this super important move. Cutting off d4 check, cutting off f1 check. Now black cannot check white, and the pawn's threatening to walk. So Gary finds this nice little triangulation. And here, ladies and gentlemen, the final dramatic moment of this entire match. Do you bring back the queen? Or do you play b4, sacrificing the pawn, and then this queen can potentially walk in here? Okay? So what do you do? There was big debate. Do you play queen to d5? Do you play queen to d3? Do you sacrifice the pawn on b4? Right? What do you do? Well, Irina Crush here suggested to get confrontational. Some of the other players suggested queen to d5. They decided to sacrifice the pawn. That was the ultimate deciding vote. Queen takes b4. Queen f3 check. King g7, d5. Queen d4, king to b1, and g6. Okay? Another very tense moment. What the heck is going on? Do you go back and try to monitor the pawn? Do you try to offer a queen trade? What happens? Well, they went queen e4. Gary played check, king b2, check, king c1, and king f6. By using queen checks, he once again shields his king away from the enemy queen, and he's threatening to promote. And after d4, g7, on October 22nd, 1999, four months after the game began, the world team resigned. And they resigned because there's no stopping the pawn. You can give some checks like this. King f7, king g5. You're going to get over here and you're going to promote and you're just going to win. Now, toward the end game, to, like around the end game, there was a moment where... Uh, Irina Crush's move did not get registered, okay? And essentially what happened is that Queen F5 would have given stiffer resistance. So on move 58, the move Queen F5 for black would have given stiffer resistance. Irina Crush's email did not go through. She had been staying up late night. She was a high schooler. That's potentially the most surprising part about this whole thing. She became a multiple-time U.S. Women's Champion Fantastic player, but she was staying up to, and, and, and her move never made it because of an email glitch and it wasn't counted. Her move ultimately wasn't counted because it passed the deadline and it spurred, you know, it spurred more. You know, ultimately, apparently this position is still uh, maybe losing uh, for, for Black, but it starts some more controversy because apparently Gary Kasparov was given opportunities, you know, to submit his moves uh, later. But uh, this was the position, the final position. And... Some final thoughts about this game. First of all, they invented a line, queen e6, uh, on move 10, right? So this game proved to have some substantial theoretical benefit because nowadays, uh, you, you actually, black, uh, you don't allow them to do this. It's kind of funny. You actually just don't let this happen. There's some other ways, like, for example, here, instead of castling, you can play d4 earlier, cd4, knight d4, g6, and uh, here you can play f3. So, so white actually now modern day delays castling to not fall into this queen e6 and then gets that kind of desired, you know, Maroxy bind structure, which is pretty funny. 
Gary Kasparov afterwards said that this was um, this was one of the, uh, he said it was a massively influential game, and he actually said that it was the game that he had analyzed more than any other in his life. Yeah, crazy, right? And that's the game. I didn't realize I, there was not a lot of coverage of it on YouTube, which is one of the reasons I wanted to cover it. It's insane that a man literally took on the entire world. Isn't that crazy? And nowadays we can't do this anymore because, you know, your average 1,000 could be, a, you know, as they call them, engine monkey, and sit there and just be like, well, I mean, obviously, you know, so. It was cool. There was a time before the engines could give us the full answers. There was no table basis to solve the end games. And anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you're a new uh, viewer, welcome. And if you're returning, welcome back. Got a lot of uh, playlists, openings, middle games, end games, puzzle solving, these kind of historical games. Is Leave me some suggestions in the comments for games that I haven't covered yet. Please don't suggest things that I have already covered in videos. That means your research skills aren't very good. I do have courses. They're on my website. Also, link is in the description. And uh, not much else to say. I'll see you in the next video.